much. You are live and recording. Well, welcome everyone. Welcome to the Harasses, uh, Harasses, uh, uh, uh U.S. Summit, and we are in a panel session, Green Cities, the Trustees of the Future. When we talk about green cities and, and being the trustees of the future, we also have to take into consideration that we are dealing in a post-pandemic post reality. The COVID pandemic has instigated a rush to work in a less congested suburb, especially in the United States. The future of cities, including expanding green spaces, instigating bikeways and urban mass transportation networks, but also we're seeing personal transportation remains very strong and actually even higher than normal standards. We've seen a lot of ground space, you know, that, that is being transformed and, and, and committed into green space, but can we actually underwrite new ways of mobility, new ways of transportation? What are the new ideas, right? And, and what are the answers? And we're gonna explore that today. Um, what I would like to do is start with a uh, quick introduction, I think before we get into the questions, and if we could, you know, kind of limit it to two minutes, three minutes, and we will start with Catherine Carlton and just kind of uh, uh, just a little bit of background and just a high level thought on, on a topic, Green Cities, Trustees of the Future. And then we'll dive into a couple of questions. Catherine. OK, thank you. Uh, well, I was educated in England and spent 11 years in greater China running tech companies there and then moved to Silicon Valley and ended up becoming uh, mayor and the, the city council for about 10 years in the city of Menlo Park in Silicon Valley. And so it was really interesting for me to go from the tech world to the government world to see the, the constraints and the, the strengths and weaknesses on, on both sides. And so I've kind of evolved uh, uh, working knowledge on smart cities and smart city technology, uh, both from the, the tech implementation side and the government. Sorry, I just uh, hear a, an echo there. Uh, anyway, so I think that that the idea of what's going to be happening with everyone moving into the to the cities and the traffic and the trust is really going to come down to uh, intelligent ways of rolling out complete streets. And complete streets means the design of the street in terms of infrastructure as well as technology to support that, that supports people walking as well as bicycles, as well as cars, as well as public transport a complete solution that respects everyone. We can't hear it. I think yeah. so. Go ahead. Yeah, so thank you, Jonathan. Thank you so much. And actually, can you please uh, jump in uh, after Catherine? Is that ask for me? Yes, of course. OK. Absolutely, very happy to talk about some of my favorite topics. So I'm Jana Remes, I'm a partner at the McKinsey Global Institute based in San Francisco and have led our work on cities for more than a decade now. As an economist, I would like to think of even the Queen City's future as kind of starting from the economic groundwork that we need to think about now as we are coming out of the pandemic. And fortunately, there is real evidence for a robust recovery as, as the health concerns abate. However, it's going to be very unequal. There's a lot of people who maintained their income, worked from home and weren't able to spend, and actually savings more than doubled in the U.S. households as a result. However, not everyone is on that train. There were those people who lost their jobs, particularly in services, and who after the, uh, the stimulus funding ends are going to be in dire straits. So I think that's going to be one of the challenges for the cities. There's going to be roaring 20s for a segment, while there's going to be folks who will actually see a much slower recovery, recovery especially as many of the service sector jobs have changed as companies have digitized and got online. So that's just one frame. It's a very unusual uh, downturn. Behaviors have also changed. Many people try digital tools for the first time, whether it's in digital health or e-grocery, especially baby boomers who might have lived the rest of their life without using the full range of digital tools. They had a very strong nudge to do that this time. And that, that is very likely to stick because most of them liked it. And people also value their time in home. So that means there is more value in having more space in your house. Suburbs are more valuable. We expect a 20% increase in working from home. So all of this just frames the, the future of cities. This is a moment of change, and it's really almost a juncture, particularly for green cities. We could, on the other hand, kind of ignore that like we did after 2009 and say, okay, we need to focus on health and economy. But on the other hand, 
if we choose to make the stimulus and the efforts that come out of this to be very green, as I think we are seeing messages from both the European Union as well as the Biden administrations that they want to do that, this could actually accelerate the green movement. So very happy to talk about more about what's happening on the ground, but this is really a moment of change. Consumers want more green environments. They want to continue work, uh, work, uh, walking. They want to continue to be able to sleep longer uh, longer nights than as they were able to do over 2020 when they weren't traveling or weren't commuting as long. The question is, what will companies and what will governments do? Thank you, Jana. Thank you so much. And, and Clay, if you could please introduce yourself and just a high level thought on Green Cities Trustees of the Future. You're muted. Yeah, sorry, trying to get my, my mic unmuted. Um, good to see everybody. Thank you for having me, sir. And great to meet the rest of you. I'm Clay Grubb. I'm the CEO of Grubb Properties based in Charlotte, North Carolina. Uh, we are a 57-year-old company that actually got its start initially from building uh, single-family homes in red line neighborhoods. And we had a, a not-for-profit finance division that financed those homes for, you know, people who are otherwise cut out of the system, primarily black families. And um, my joke was the way my dad was able to justify a not-for-profit finance division was he broke all the child labor laws. So at age 12, I collected mortgages and did amortization schedules by hand instead of playing football and basketball. Um, but today we continue to expand uh, with that same compassionate approach and we're focused on what we call essential housing. And we do that through a product called Link Apartments that we branded nationally. And they're currently in the process of taking it nationally. And we have a number of tools that we drive down the cost of construction. Uh, the primary one being trying to eliminate the car and get people out on bicycles. And, and then we fear parking with office users and, and other aspects. Um, and then I've also just recently finished a book called Creating the Urban Dream, uh, focused on uh, how we create equity and economic mobility through housing. Thank you so much. And, and uh, Slava, if you could, please. Sure, yeah. So my name is Slava. I'm co-founder and CEO of Mighty Buildings. We are a prefab builder out of Auckland, and we uniquely use 3D printing and robotics uh, to build uh, not just cool homes, but actually sustainable homes, and um, in future, even significantly more affordable than alternatives on the market. We're still early in this uh, mission. So we started from ADU uh, market, which is uh, accessory dwelling units or backyard studios, and, and uh, we essentially realized that uh, talking about like really future of cities, which was actually very uh, interesting, was impacted by COVID. We, we start thinking more and more of people like coming out of cities and living more like in suburbs and sort of smaller towns and stuff like that. And this uh, got this so huge impact on sort of creating density push on those smaller cities, right? And this ADU law came in play, uh, it was a pass about like three, four years ago. I, I don't remember exactly, like, uh, but basically, in, initially, when ADU law, uh, California state of California passes law, uh, the, there was no much urgency, right? But now everyone realized that actually this is the fastest way to add density to smaller towns, to suburbs. And that's actually very much in line with, uh, uh, with what other uh, speakers are talking about, like creating better sustainable environment, uh, which is... Instead of like really trying to go super dense, uh, you just kind of like naturally adding more, a little more density to the uh, to neighborhoods. Um, and uh, one other thing we really uh, thinking the cities will uh, be changing over the next ten years in California specifically is this uh, vision of net energy uh, zero homes, right? So like essentially, if you're aware, like uh, the the house. Uh, producing more energy than it consumed from the grid, right? So what, this is what is defined as uh, energy at uh, home. And, and this is already happening. We're committing for the first development, for instance, with uh, this um, requirements in mind. 
Uh, I think the more and more development will happen like that. Uh, of course, California is a little bit easier place to do things like that just because of solar and stuff. But many other states will follow the trend, I believe. That's my belief and that's my hope. Thank you so much, Slava and uh, Nicholas. Uh, basically, we're just asking for a small introduction, a little bit of background, and uh, just a high level thoughts on, you know, Green City's uh, trustees of the future before we dive into our questions. Super. Yeah, thank you. And it's a, it's a pleasure to be with everybody here. And I apologize for joining a little late, some, uh, some tech issues. Um, uh, I'm, a, I'm a venture capitalist. Um, and um, my background is in clean tech, the term that I coined about 20 years ago, and um, relative late bloomer on the real estate front. But what I'm uh, currently doing is working with uh, both social entrepreneurs and um, and commercial developers to let to help them understand when innovation of one kind or another is ready for prime time. When is the sharing economy to be specced? Uh, when is uh, rooftop solar ready? And um, so that's given me some views on uh, how, how we approach this. And happy to join the conversation as we move forward. Thank you so much. Well, thank you, everyone. Just a way of background as, as your, uh, uh, your host here with um, uh, chairing the panel. My name is Sergio Fernandez de Cordova. I'm a chairman of uh, P3 Smart Cities, which is a smart city holding company. We, do, we have a bunch of different investments from aerospace to mobility, to Wi-Fi and connectivity. I'm focused on master planning of future cities, not just in, in that space, but we also have a foundation that we focus on how we use media, data, technology, and policy, advancing governments and looking at the future of uh, cities with a C model, social impact, environmental impact, economic impact, and how we're building the future. So welcome, and uh, to those watching, welcome, and thank you for joining us. And so we're gonna get started, um, you know, kind of when we look at this panel, and thank you everyone for for your, your, your thoughts, and, and I'd like to kind of, you know, um, talk about what does the future of green cities look like in a post pandemic world in a post COVID world and i think this is kind of you know this could be a 20 minute response by everyone so i kind of want to you know get us to compress that because this is an exciting topic but um i also i i i'd love to kick it off with you jana and uh just uh, given your background i think it'd be good to also frame it uh, from your perspective and then have everyone kind of provide their feedback because when we look at being trustees of the future, right, and and when you look at what Nicholas said about you know sort of green tech, right, we you know technology as looking at the future of green cities must play a role in that future, and and it's really going to be you know how we're going to help solve and, and create a more sustainable tomorrow. Uh, Jana, please, uh, the mic is yours. Real, real quick beforehand, can can whoever's not speaking hit mute because we're definitely getting feedback and it's it's distracting yeah if somebody actually has two devices on that's probably it if you only have one device but good idea mute perfect so uh on in general i i, I very much believe that this is a junction point whether it's from the perspective of green cities in the way of uh of the more traditional more let's say not so new technology, but the older technology of public transit, of electricity, of everything else, as well as the digitization, because of the fact that, first of all, most cities had to very quickly up their digital game in their own operations in order to adjust, adjust to the lockdowns and the fact that everybody wanted to operate at the distance. At the same time, many consumers came into the digital world and a lot of industries that were laggards had to adapt quickly. So, for example, healthcare and elderly care, where typically the adoption rates had been very low, really had to up their game and they accelerated faster than most other segments. And e-grocery that was a laggard on the grocery sector was the one that actually saw the more than doubling over the last time period. So this is really a moment of opportunity for tech companies to understand what is the next step? One of the beauties of having looked at tech platforms in the past is that oftentimes when we look at them right before, 
we can't see even half of the opportunities that a new technology provides. And I think that is, for me, what is really exciting about the green cities, what the private sector, what the cities, what the collaboration between the so, um, social sector will bring in that will kind of completely open up new worlds. However, I think it is also a moment for the public sector to make some big choices because we are seeing the locations of the where people want to spend their time and money shift. Commuter centers that used to be the attractions of business um, are going to see a slight decline in their business and that's going to move elsewhere. So being agile in how to create transportation options that are not only the one train line that goes to the city center and the financial financial center, but enables a kind of green transport across different neighborhoods, for example, nearby. I think that's going to be one of the challenges for many cities. Thank you so much. And actually, I am going to go to uh, Catherine, who's had a big smile on her face while you were talking. And obviously, she's got incredible experience as a mayor. And and again, Catherine, we're looking at, you know, sort of in a post-pandemic, green cities. Miss Mayor, please. You know, um, well, I'm not mayor anymore, but uh, I know. it's... it's you it's still funny. carry the title, right? <laughs> Um, the, I think the jury is still out, frankly, on uh, what the post-pandemic, what that means, uh, when there's going to be a post-pandemic and how long that's going to last. Um, so right now, the, the trends that we're seeing are good and bad. Um, on the bad for our smaller cities and medium-sized cities is people aren't going to our local mom and pop shops. They've gotten used to ordering off Amazon, and that's going to be a critical problem. Um, but the the good part of that is that you've seen a lot of cities closing down streets and moving the, the eating outside for the restaurants. And they're putting up semi-permanent places that the people really like. And I don't think they're going to go away that quick right afterwards. I think that we're going to have a lot more of a resurgence as soon as people can go out without their masks and going and eating together and eating outside and, and, and supporting uh, the local businesses. And the, the interesting thing, though, is with the, the transportation and how that's going to be supported is people, you know, commonly think of, of streets as being a civil or structural engineering problem, but really more and more it's an IT problem uh, or an IT opportunity uh, as these things move forward. The, whether it's in tech or whether it's in government uh, and business, the, the IT department's going from these two guys in this back room to the center, to the periphery of, of people's strategy and how they roll these things out. And it's going to make life, I think, a, a lot better as we see people. Did you know that in, in most cities, 30% of the traffic are people circling around looking for parking spaces? As we have more intelligent streets, the parking space is going to be able to communicate with the car and let you know where it is so that you can more efficiently go straight in and, and park, and that's going to relieve a lot of the, the traffic. We have a problem as uh, we get more and more people buying electric cars, where are they all gonna charge? We can't uh, necessarily immediately have them for all the people uh, in apartment buildings, for example, and it's taking up areas in parking spaces and public parking, but what's happening right now, which is really exciting in Sweden, they have a, a way that they're working on to have a lane in the highway where it will actively charge your car as you're driving on the freeway. And this is beautiful, not only for freeing up the spaces and allowing people to charge their cars, but it's going to be fantastic for the trucks and the long haul places to not have to stop for an hour, 30 minutes, whatever, to they can have the long haul and they can have that infrastructure uh, suspended uh, over long amounts of time, which, which makes it more viable. There are a lot of really beautiful things happening, but it's important, you know, Klaus Schwab talks about the fourth industrial revolution and that's systems. It's all about systems. We're no longer in the third industrial revolution, which was, you know, these, this IT stovepipe and this, everything's going to be talking to each other, the car spaces, the, the traffic lights, the roads, the cars. And we have to get in front of how we plan for those systems as they come together. Um, the, the, one of my, my favorite quotes from Abraham Lincoln is the best way to, to uh, predict the future is to create it. And as we've got more and more people moving into these towns, the, the, I think it was the UN, I forget who it was, uh, basically came out with some research with global population and migration trends that show that there'll be almost as many people living in cities in 2050 
as exist today on the entire planet. Uh, think about that as a challenge for humanity. It's not just uh, how we're going to be managing uh, the traffic, it's going to be how we manage the food, how we get it back and forth, how we deal with the, the energy. I love what you're doing with those houses because as the houses become net zero, if you put a, a, a solar panel on top, that house becomes part of the electric grid and everyone starts contributing to that power, which is, is a fantastic thing. Right. Um, waste management, uh, infrastructure needs that we don't even think about. Right now, they've got fabulous ways of capturing all the compost and using that to power the lights in the, the parks. You know, so as we see these things coming forward, there, there are bad things that we have to plan for, of course, but there's so many really exciting, great ways that we're moving together to have a more sustainable and a more equitable future together. Thank you, Catherine, and, and uh, thank you for that. And I actually was, was going to go into housing, but I'm actually going to come back to green tech. And I'd love to, you know, uh, give Nicholas an opportunity here to also chime in because when you start to look at, you know, what you, exactly what you're talking about with that future imagining, but not just imagining, but inventing and building on it, it, it you know, green tech, is, it plays into that, you know, future of what a green city will be. <laughs> you got muted. Everybody else is at the same time. You're, you're muted. Love work. If, if you're on mute, it's not the uh, the takeaway expression of 2020. I don't know what is. Um, what I was uh, saying was that um, I think tech is is even more radical um, in, 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 than we might imagine. Uh, I'll go out on a limb and, and even challenge the notion that more of us are going to be living in cities uh, in the future. Uh, if I look at the situation on the ground in places like India, Nigeria, uh, Cambodia, where I'm active, we're actually seeing the potential for reverse urbanization. If you can get everything you want, healthcare, education, uh, work, uh, while living in where your social connections are, etc., and not have to live in a big, polluted, dangerous, um, uh, city, then why wouldn't you? And I, I think this is likely to happen in a post-COVID world, and I think we're seeing the first evidence of this in places like Nigeria and India. Um, the second point really is um, uh, I don't think technology in itself is a panacea. Um, we, we had huge problems with sidewalk labs where I live in Toronto, um, largely because the social compact couldn't um, couldn't be addressed in a way that was satisfactory to uh, relevant stakeholders. So I think we have to turn this around and look at how technology can democratize things, um, how it can uh, deal with not only uh, the green agenda, but the social agenda and ultimately the economic agenda. And um, uh, self-promotion alert, um, uh, I'm involved with a, a, a new real estate fund, which has just done a first closing, uh, 50 million, and it's called One Planet Living, based on uh, the approach developed by a, a husband and wife team in London, uh, now applied to over $30 billion of real estate projects. And the reason I mention this is that we have found that technology can lead to not only net zero outcomes, but can it help with things like the fact that people know three times the number of um, three times the number of names of neighbors as would be the norm, and I think if there's any takeaway from the pandemic, it's that um, it's our inter interconnection. You know, the the recognition that my business model is only as resilient as your as my customers are, and so if we're looking to use tech, I think the tech has to emphasize much more the social dimension. Because honestly, as already mentioned, getting to net zero in a building, in a way that's old hat. Um, uh, it's a design issue now, and the design issue has to factor in all three legs of the stool. Uh, and uh, my last point here is that if we're, that design leads to systems, which means complexity, which means more data, and so we need the tools of AI and ML 
to make sense of this and design accordingly. Sorry, just to finish. Thanks. No, thank you, Nicholson. Thank you so much. And I think when um, I think you may, this is a great segue when you talk about reverse urbanization, right? I live in New York City, and you know a lot of people have been saying, "Oh my God, New York is dead." No, it's not dead. It's just a shift has happened. People have decided that there's this element of reverse urbanization. There's a lot of people that have decided, hey, I'm going to go out to the Catskills, move out where I could actually have, um, you know, a, a Nicholas, can you mute, please? And um, and basically, you know, have that ability to have a better life, a more open space, right? And you look at green, it's just that's also happening in everyone's household, right? And when we look at, you know, real estate development and where and how our communities you know, being designed, definitely would love to, you know, in, invite Slava and, and Clay to kind of dive into that side of the conversation. Slava, you as a, as a developer um, of, of the actual product, the homes, you know, tell us, you know, kind of, you know, where you see this and, and, and how you're personally handling it. From the Great. You are on uh, your favorite Yes, now I figure out. <laughs> okay, cool. Yeah, so I agree with uh, a couple of previous speakers uh, on uh, deurbanization piece. I would I would more uh, be, uh, think of this as like going from sort of high rise, uh, very dense city like downtowns to more like spread out cities uh, of future, which will be more like uh, maybe not necessarily single family homes, but more like you know three four story buildings, efficiently designed. Uh, you know, potentially smaller uh, people. People would would definitely live smaller uh, than they currently live. You know, this entire movement of tiny homes. Uh, but this kind of start getting larger momentum, even like with major developers, right? So, like in general, if you look at the every size of home in U.S. historically, it was like super big and like uh, disproportionately big. I would say, like to the rest of the world, right? Uh, and now it's just becoming more and more reasonable. And, and, and the push there from millennials and uh, some younger uh, people moving outside of cities and sort of like already being very used to sort of like smaller flats, apartments and kind of, and the families are typically small as well if they get, uh, you know, the couples. So basically we, we, we just have this in, for instance, now development, uh, which we just announced is Polari Group. Uh, in Southern California, uh, it's, it's just like literally uh, 1,400 square feet, right? And this is a perfect size for family, right? So for smaller, uh, for just a couple, it can be as small as like, you know, um, 800, right, square feet. So if you talk about single family, for like, you know, uh, uh, apartments, uh, I think, uh, or like uh, townhomes, it, it potentially can be even sometimes smaller. So this is like two major trends which will happen, which will have larger impact on the uh, sustainability. Um, you know, it will just, uh, it may be sometimes even positive, sometimes negative, because if you go like lower and more spread out, uh, it means like the, like if you continue the same, you know, uh, traveling patterns uh, and commuting patterns that you had before COVID, Potentially, you have to spend more time in, in sort of like traveling around. But because a lot of companies are already changing the models for larger, for longer term, actually. So they allow like remote work um, or like constant remote, permanent remote work. I think people will just travel less, commute less, right? Uh, so I think uh, in general, uh, we will see this changing patterns or a negative, uh, like decreasing um impact of transportation. Uh, we will talk about transportation separately, right? And finally, uh, I also think uh, people um, uh, and buyers like of homes um, and, you know, apartments and, and those developers who uh, jump on new projects post-COVID, they start becoming very aware of sustainability uh, impact, uh, in general, like impact on the environment, uh, not just... Uh, uh, you know, carbon footprint, but also things like which are more near term. Like, you know, if you look at energy bill, right? If you're able to optimize like 50% of your energy bill uh, as operator, for instance, as single family home rental and single family home rental business, you can immediately uh, create this uh, outsized impact on your financial uh, financials, right? And people start recognizing this. So it's sort of becoming, instead of just being like for long term, it was just a, sustainability kind of pitch 
a vision and stuff like that, it just start becoming a, a mainstream in a way, right? And I think more things uh, will happen like that. Then the government will impact uh, developers um, these carbon, you know, tax, tax credits or things like that. Something along these lines should start happening. Uh, and, and and again, like I, I just I just think it's 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 just becoming the mainstream, like uh, just changing the way uh, um, of how developers think about future homes, which we start seeing that. Well, again, another great segue, and thank you so much, Slava, because you know this really kind of brings us to Clay, and I think you know one of the things that Clay had mentioned before, but I also just kind of want to highlight: he's been his family's been in the business since 1963, building communities, right? Not only that, but when I start to think about the work that we do, and we think about green cities and trustees of the future, a key part of what we are talking about as a trustee of the future, it's not just the green tech, it's not just the green economy, it's not just amazing homes to live in and affordable, but also how you're building the community itself and how you're driving impact with everything you do. And I just think that, you know, Clay, when I looked at your background and how your business model is actually focused on not only building communities, but also making sure you're giving back and building from within, right? Helping those that are underserved. And I think it's in that context, if you could also kind of, you know, bring all these pieces together from the tech, from the government, from, you know, where the future is going. But, you know, you're living and breathing it right now with the communities. And and again, I, I it was uh, 60 years, almost 60 years of of the space. So please. Uh, the, the Thank you, Sergio. Yeah. And I think from our standpoint, um, you know, we believe community is, is live and well. And uh, but it's certainly been stressed the last year. Uh, we're as bullish on urban areas as we've ever been in our business. And, and a lot of that has to do with, with demographics. Um, you know, I think today in America, you have more 30 year olds than you've ever had in the history of America. Um, you actually have more 13 year olds than you have 30 year olds. So those folks want to be in areas where they're interacting with people. They're excited about it. They're going to drive uh, the urbanization, as Catherine was talking about. You know, more people are going to live in cities in 2050 than, than exist today. And so uh, while COVID has paused that, uh, I think at the end of the day, there'll be a mass acceleration to catch back up. You know, the number one obstacle, though, in urban environments is the affordability of housing and, uh, and mobility, uh, I think, plays a big part of that. Um, one of the things that, that's pretty neat that we do, you talked about compassion and our history of creating communities. And one of the things that we've done is uh, is we actually, if you live in one of our apartments over five years, we cap your rent at CPI. And we have hundreds of families now with capped rents and, and they create real community in what is typically known as a fairly transient component of living. Um, you know, I think we've got one property with over 90 members of a 300 unit apartment community that have been there an average of about 14 years. And, uh, and I, in fact, my daughter Rosalie uh, shares the name with one of our residents who's been in her apartment for over 35 years. And so, um, you know, those folks really help create community. And, uh, but at the end of the day, we have to continue to figure out how to make it's so that folks of all levels can get in. And, and I continue to go back to the mobility, be a big component of it. I mean, you know, today the average American spends $9,700 a year just on their car. And if you're making, you know, $30,000 a year, that, that's, that's an easy home payment. And, uh, and today, you know, 80% of Americans can't afford the price of a new home in America, uh, which, uh, Slava's obviously a big part of trying to help figure that out. Um, but 40% of Americans can't afford the average price of a new apartment. Um, and so one of the big things that we've been really pushing is getting these communities to quit. You know, many of them still have parking minimums for anything you build. And so today, if I were to build you know, a 300 unit apartment community in downtown Charlotte and have to park it at traditional ratios, uh, that apartment community would cost me $75 million. If I don't have to park it at all, 
I can build this same same 300 unit apartment community for $60 million and use a lot less land. And that is the way, you know, we're getting people out of the cars. I was lucky the Knight Foundation took me to Copenhagen for several days and really got in, in ingrained in the whole program there. And Copenhagen Eyes, who's probably the premier cycle infrastructure designers in the world, now goes with us in every project we do. We're their only North American client, um, private client, and um, which is a shame. I feel like... Uh, If we can make it safe, people are going to walk and bike. And and I think those are, are big, big components of how we green a city going forward. Thank you, Clay. I um I want to be conscious. It looks like we, I, I didn't mean, they did not realize that we are almost running out of time. So we're going to have to do a speed round, right? And I think that, you know, one of the areas that, you know, Clay just mentioned it, and it was mentioned before, is is really, you know, sort of the future of transportation. So if I could kind of get all of you to kind of just look at, you know, one minute, right, because then we'll have our parting words. Um, in one minute, what can you say, where is the future of transportation? Uh, what do you think the future of cities and transportation? Like, you know, just if you could try to hold on to that as, as, uh, as tight as possible. And uh, we're going to start with uh, Nicholas. Okay. If I can help you unmute. Yeah. I'm actually, um, uh, you know, just a footnote here. I'm actually legally blind. And I got to tell you, the Zoom world and its derivatives is uh, is fun to play with. Um, and it's not. Uh, user yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I don't think Elon Musk is the future of transport. I think it's it's public transit of some kind, but it's not the public transit that we grew up with. I think the model, again, will come from the global south, and it'll be kind of the Uberization of public transit. And um, uh, I think that's coming, and I think it's going to save huge amounts of money, particularly for small cities. So I could go on about that, but I think, my point here is that there's a lot of savings and a lot of value hidden in civic assets and in technology. And we have to use this to not only solve problems, but to liberate budget to solve other things that might not relate to green or whatever. Thank you, Nicholas. And, and uh, so with that, Catherine, if you could, please uh, also your, your comments and, and yeah, so much to say in one minute. Um, I, I agree very much with what Jana was saying. We're, we're at this amazing crux of everything coming together. And, and even when I say everything's in systems, half the reason why we have the traffic in our area is because of the housing. People can't afford to live in one area, so they have to commute back and forth. If we can provide more affordable housing for people to live and play and work in an area where it's it's possible for them to ride their bike. I think a lot of people really in, enjoy that and would, would do that. And so these things are intertwined. They're, they're not independent. And to, to her point, the, the future is here. It's just not evenly distributed. And we have to make sure that, that it is. So I'm, I'm delighted to hear what some of the other people on this panel are, are working on. Um, but I also think it's really important uh, as we move forward for people to remember to benchmark as a government, we have to be very responsible for how we spend our money, for how we explain what we're doing. And uh, for example, uh, Philadelphia did a benchmark when they rolled out their online system uh, for their paperwork system for their admin going online. They took 270 hours worth of work and crunched it down to 27 hours. Had they not benchmarked it, they wouldn't have been able to, to basically know that to share that and be able to justify what they're doing so whether we're working on better streets better housing and all this i think it's important to make sure that we are, are aware of how it affects the other things those knock-on effects are so critical thank you catherine so clay uh being in the housing space are you building bicycles or how how uh you know someone with with your experience of building communities uh, 
Yeah, no, I, I think Catherine's dead on. We need to benchmark. We need that data. Um, the reality is, is land use is, is so critical. And this, you know, nimbyism, um, you know, it's exciting that, you know, California is as a state is getting so aggressive with their communities. And, and that's what's made a North Carolina company like ours actually embrace coming to California. And, um, you know, you now have these municipalities much more receptive to, hey, yes, we want people living near where they work. We want people to walk to their entertainment. Um, you know, the one thing that, you know, my joke always was is that, uh, you know, the big, big tune for the millennials was a uh, rabid animal by uh, Lake Street Dive. I always said it summed it up because it said, you know, their first line is another night wasted in my parents' basement. And they're all living at home to be in these urban areas with their parents. But they want to get out and, and get their apartments, but they don't, you know, they don't they don't even want to have their driver's license. And they certainly aren't going to drink and drive and do these other things. So they want to have access to transportation and want to live near where they work and play. Thank you. Thank you, Clay. Um, Slava, what are you seeing as you're doing the development and, and of your homes? And again, the future of transportation from your perspective? Yeah, so we're a little bit more lucky in terms of like uh, uh, these parking uh, requirements and stuff like that, just because we start in this ADU market, like backyard studio market, which is sort of like designed to increase the density, but uh, the law was designed to increase the density and sort of the parking requirements of weight. Um, so, uh, but uh, I do, I do uh, like believe that I mean, like, I'm not necessarily, uh, I don't necessarily agree that uh, millennials um, and even like younger generation uh, will just skip uh, or car ownership altogether. They will, they may like co-own or like, you know, just access vehicles and car transport some other creative ways, right? And, and just, just because even like using Uber these days is still expensive, right? So like, and... And like, um, I mean, I, I just I just believe there will be ways to uh, kind of access the car ownership in the sort of more shared ways. And uh, but uh, the ownership like may not necessarily be as we kind of uh, know it now. It may be it may be even access for some other, uh, you know, uh, systems, um, you know, like um, is 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 and, and in general, like in housing industry as well, will be disrupted. The ownership, the way we think about ownership, uh, may change as well, right? So, like, um, uh, so, but one thing which will definitely happen is just in general, as I already mentioned, there will be less commute uh, in general. So this will impact across the board, like all the uh, all the transportation issues and stuff. People will still travel like once the situation uh, finish. I think people will still travel a lot, especially millennials like this.